Hi. So today what we want to establish is a relation between angular velocities and the rate to which our quaternion changes. So just as a small reminder, we know that we can use quaternion through quaternion multiplication to establish uh, the rotation of vectors through this expression over here. And this will give me exactly the same vector, but on a different basis. So for instance, if this is a inertial frame, if this is a frame I and this is a frame B, this will be the quaternion that takes the rotation from, fr from frame I to frame B. And you can find that, uh, that vector through this formula, as we know from quaternion multiplication and how quaternions decode rotation. However, if this pattern, if this frame B is rotating with respect to frame I in time, so this is frame B, and this frame B depends on time with respect to some frame I, what you will have is that this quaternion is not a fixed number, it's not a fixed set of four numbers, but instead that this quaternion changes in time. So both of those changes in time. And we want to understand how this evolution is done. We know that uh, angular velocities is what describe those rates. And therefore, we should expect that there is a relation between the angular velocity and the quaternion dot. When quaternion dot is really the derivative that you would think, if you take here all the quaternion uh, components and you take the derivative one by one. So when I talk about the quaternion derivative in time, this is what I'm talking about, is the each one of those quaternion components differentiated with respect to time. And we want to know how they, how would that be? Now, we can think about this. So before going into that derivative of, of this itself, I just want to make a small notice of, of quaternion uh, on composition of rotations. So for instance, if we want to rotate from a time d, and then later we have the same b, but on a time uh, t plus delta t, that means that there exists a rotation here, a quaternion, that takes from this time t to time t plus delta t. This means that, uh, and the way we decode this is not by an addition of the quaternion. It should be by composition, by doing this formula once again. So for instance, if we want to add a q, add this guy over here, what we want to do really is to, we have this vector over here, zero vi, and we will rotate it from uh, to b with qt. Right? And later we want to add to rotate it even more by delta t. So we will add here a delta q. So this would be our delta q that we are adding later. And this our delta q inverse over here. And as we go, so we can compose quaternion rotations by the quaternion product. So this would be the composition of rotations in time. And notice that they are done by, by, a, by a quaternion multiplication instead. So we need, so the derivative, but the derivative here is really what you would expect. It's just the normal dif differentiation. I mean, when I think of a q dot, where, what I'm really thinking is on the limit when time goes to zero of q plus delta t minus q of t divided by delta t. But this is not exactly a rotation because quaternions, they just do not work that way. The way they compose rotations is through multiplication. So let's apply that inside. Uh, this will be the limit delta t from zero. Now this, the q at t plus delta t is really the q of t with this delta q now, now minus q of t divided by delta t. Notice that my limit is taken with respect to delta t, so this two can go outside the limit, and what we will have is q t times the limit, and this times it's really a quaternion times through delta q minus 1 divided by t. And this one is the unit quaternion. Uh, so this is the unit, the quaternion unit. Just our normal one that we multiply is the quaternion, um, is the identity by multiplication. 
So having that, this is the part that we really want. And notice that delta Q then, we can go back to the, how delta Q corresponds to a rotation. And this will be how it decodes rotation if we call this like so, like this. So if you have, this is how quaternion relates to a delta angle and the axis of rotation. And for very small thetas, we, since this is a limiting uh, condition, what we have over here is that this cosine of theta minus one will be, for the, in the limiting case, this will be one. In the limiting case, this will be the, the instantaneous axis of rotation and the sine of theta for very limiting angles will become like so. And then we add this to the limit over here. This minus one will cancel with this one over here. And we will have the, that this limit, in the end of the day, will be Q of t quaternion multiplied by uh, minus 1 will be then 0 over here. This n stays over there, divided by these two. And delta t over delta t will give you the angular velocity. And this will give us what we wanted, which is this angular velocity in the very beginning. So this is our omega. And therefore, what we have is that q dot is equal to q one half of q multiplied by omega, by a zero omega. So this is the final formula that we want. And I just want to give one more property about this formula in particular, because this can be written in multiple ways. Another way that this can be done, you can go through the multiplication here, and that will give you Q, well, this is quaternion multiplication as we know it. So this will be, let me just uh, make them a very explicit over here, times uh, zero, and omega. Perhaps here we can also see those three as one unit that I will call Q vector. Okay, this just for notation. And if we go through the math, what we will have, I'll let you guys do this as an exercise. We will have a matrix here that is zero minus omega transpose omega and minus omega. This is the matrix that performs a cross product through Q. Okay, this part over here can be written, oh sorry, this Q is really uh, the, the quaternion. This can be written as that. And if you call this M, this is another way of seeing the same equation, huh? but if you call this M, notice that M is uh, skew symmetric. Meaning that if you take M transpose, M transpose will be the transpose of this matrix, so B is zero. Over here, we will have this guy over there, so it will be omega transpose. Over here, you will have that guy falling over here, so it will be minus omega transpose. And this matrix is skew symmetric itself, so you will have uh, omega transpose. Remember that the cross product is a skew, sy is, uh, it's a skew symmetric matrix. So this, but in the other, in the end of the day, Notice that this is nothing else than minus M. This is what we call a skew symmetric matrix. Means that when you take the transpose, you get the minus of it. And that's extremely interesting for differential equations because of the following. Uh, if you take the norm of a quaternion, right? So take the norm squared of a quaternion. And I want you to know how the norm itself, this is a number. Uh, this is a real number. And I want to know what happens to the derivative of this number in time. So the derivative of that number, well, we can compute it. This, the norm of a quaternion can be written in vector form as Q transpose Q, right, the norm squared. So if you take that derivative, this will give us two Q trans, transpose times Q dot. This is the derivative of, uh, of two vectors. Q dot, now we know how to compute it. So this will give me two Q transpose times Q dot, which is uh, one half so this half will go over here, uh, one half of this n 
times Q itself. And now I just want to analyze this a little bit further. What is that? So uh, that is a number still, this is a real number. And any real number, of course, since that's just a number, every number is equal to its transpose, right? So I'm expecting Q transpose and Q to be equal to Q transpose and Q transpose. That's simply by the fact that this is a real number. Therefore, if you take the transpose of the product is the product of the of the of the the transpose of the product is the product of the transpose in order reverse, right? So this will be Q transpose times N transpose times Q. So this is what we have. But for this specific case, M transpose is equal to minus N. So we will have minus Q transpose M Q. So this is equal to that. What I can do is take this part and take it to the left side. So this will be two Q transpose M Q will be equal to zero. And therefore Q M Q is equal to zero, which means that this product over here is actually uh, zero. So this entire thing is zero, and, and therefore this derivative here, it's zero. And that's a very interesting property, which kind of makes a, a very comfortable environment for us to work with. Which means, because since here I put just a phase, notice that I put a phase of the quaternion inside the limit, so I'm taking the derivative of the phase. But this could really be any quaternion, because this differential equation here as it is, what we put here, we checked what was the quaternion of this different, the, the norm of the quaternion, assuming this quaternion respects this differential equation, and if does, this norm should not evolve in time. Okay, so this is a constant, and uh, as soon as you put any quaternion through this differential equation, the, con the, 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 the amplitude of that quaternion will not change, only its phase. So that goes to say, again, that we can use non-unitary quaternions for rotation. And as soon as you put them in this differential equation, it will drive it in a way that you won't change its norm. It will change it only its phase. And uh, normally, uh, a lot of people will just use the, the, the unitary because they suffice for rotations. But I would like you to think a little bit of this can be done if you also use the amplitude and you evolve. This is actually interesting for uh, optimization application as well. When you don't need to restrict yourself to unitary quaternions, that can bring you some interesting properties. And I'll let you think about that. But uh, until next time, goodbye. <laughs>